Hello everyone, welcome to the third part of my tutorial series Diving to C++11 Today we're gonna take a break from game development and we're gonna learn more about uh, pointers and uh, basic memory management uh, Today's video is intended for people that want uh, to learn more about uh, these subjects but also to beginners who have never used pointers or uh, managed memory uh, manually before and want to learn more about uh, these topics so, we're gonna learn the difference between objects allocated on the stack and on the free store, that is often referred to as heap. Also, we're gonna learn what pointers are and how we can use them. And uh, in the end, we're gonna, hand, we're gonna learn how to manage dynamic memory. And that means how to allocate objects on the free store and uh, deal with uh, uh, the allocation and manual management. So let's begin uh, with objects lifetime, which is uh, very, a very important uh, uh, topic uh, about C and C++. We talk about objects lifetime, also as storage, storage class or storage method. So in C and C++, all variables are allocated with a storage method. The default method is automatic storage. Automatic storage and automatic lifetime are two terms that can be used interchangeably. A variable with automatic lifetime is allocated at the beginning of a code block and the allocated at the end of the code block. A code block is a portion of code between curly braces. So, uh, for example, this is a code block. As you can see, it starts with a curly brace and ends with another. Also, a function is a code block. Uh, for example, the main function begins with a curly brace and ends with another curly brace. So, when, uh, when we create a variable inside of a code block, uh, it will be allocated, and at the end of the code block, it is said that the variable goes out of scope, and here the variable is deallocated, and also it cannot be used uh, outside of the code block. So, for example, in this code block beginning at line 46, we uh, declare a new variable var of type int, we do an assignment, as uh, just as an example. And uh, in the moment we declare the variable, we allocate memory for the variable on the stack. And the moment we uh, exit from the code block, we say that var is now out of scope, and uh, we cannot uh, obviously uh, refer to var anymore. And uh, also the memory uh, that was allocated for var is freed, and uh, that's it basically. It is this automatic memory management. So uh, we can create a simple class with uh, a constructor and a destructor that print something to the terminal in order to make it uh, to make this uh, automatic storage easier to understand. Since this tutorial is also aimed to beginners, uh, someone might be unfamiliar with classes, so let's give a rough explanation. A class is basically a type like int or float that the user can define the code and it provides structure and behavior. By structure we mean variables and state, and by behavior we mean functions that are called methods. For example, here we define a class called example, and uh, it has a, a variable called id, which is the structure, and we also have uh, some behavior, which is a constructor, uh, that is a function that uh, is automatically called when uh, allocating a variable of type example which takes uh, an integer um, argument and also prints the id argument and we have a destructor that is uh, uh, an a function that is automatically called on variable the allocation and uh, prints the uh, uh, and uh, the id of uh, the class so uh, the fact that uh, our constructor and our destructor print uh, the object's ID, it's very useful to understand when an object gets allocated or deallocated. And we'll use this information in the terminal to understand how automatic storage works in C and C++. So let's create some ex instances of example and analyze what happens when they get allocated and deallocated. So, uh, we, we open a new code block, as you can see here, and we close it here. Inside the, the code block, we define two instances of example, which is our class. The first instance is a 
ex1 and the second is ex2 and uh, the first one is initialized with the uh, id1 so this one basically gets into the constructor here and id gets initialized with one and uh, that will make uh, the constructor print ctor of one and the same thing happens here basically this two will be will become the classes id and it will be uh, and the ctor of two will be printed on the terminal so basically uh, only defining the class is enough to call the constructor when dealing with automatic storage in fact uh, after writing these two lines of code we will see that ex1 will get allocated and ctor1 will be printed on the, on the terminal and ex2 sorry ex2 will be allocated and ctor2 will be printed on the terminal after allocating and constructing the variables we will reach the end of the block and uh, basically at the end of the block uh, both variables will be out of scope when the variables are out of scope they will be automatically deallocated and destroyed deallocated means that the memory that was used for the variable will be now freed and destroyed means that uh, uh, the destructor of the variable will be freed as you can see when x2 and x1 uh, get out of scope dtor2 will be printed first and then dtor1 will be printed uh, the order is uh, well defined and it is an, a LIFO order which means last in first out basically the last variable that we declared will be the first one to be deallocated and destroyed in this case the first variable to be constructed is ex1 and the second one is ex2 so the destruction happens in the opposite order the first one to be destructed will be ex2 and the second one to be destructed will be ex1 before moving on to the rest of the code let's uh, run this example and uh, we'll check if uh, our assumptions are correct to avoid running the rest of the code i'll add a return statement here and uh, i'll just run the code in my terminal okay as you can see our assumptions were correct in fact uh, ctor1 is called ctor2 is called and then the opposite order uh, we see that uh, ditor2 is called and then ditor1 is called let's now move on to the rest of the code i'll remove the return here and uh, this is a more complex example where we use nested blocks so we define a big block here and inside of this big block there is another smaller block in the big block we uh, declare and allocate uh, an instance of example called ex1 with id1 and uh, in the moment we declare it it will be allocated and constructed so our, our assumption is that uh, ctor1 will be printed then we define a smaller block inside of the bigger one and we declare ex2 uh, another instance of example with id2 and here it will be allocated and constructed and ctor2 will be printed now what happens is that we reach the end of the uh, smaller block so ex2 becomes out of scope so ex2 will be allocate deallocated and destroyed and this or two will be printed now inside the bigger block we declare another variable called ex3 and we construct it with 3 as its id so here ex3 will be allocated and constructed and c3 will be printed now we reach the end of the block here and what happens is that the ex1 and the x3 are now out of scope the first one to be allocated will be the last one to be uh, sorry the first one to be deallocated will be the last one to be allocated so uh, the first one uh, to be destroyed will be ex3 and the detour 3 will be printed and the last one to be destroyed will be ex1 and detour 1 will be printed as I did earlier, I will uh, add a return statement here and we will check out uh, if uh, our assumptions are correct. So, uh, this is our first example and this is our second example. As you can see, uh, ex1 prints ctor1, ex2 prints ctor2. Now ex2 goes out of scope and it prints ctor2 ex3 
is now constructed and it prints C to 3. Now both EX1 and EX3 go out of scope and they print D to 3 and D to 1 in the opposite order they were constructed in. As I said in the beginning of the video, uh, the default storage mode for variables in both C and C++ is automatic storage. So all the you've seen with our examples applies to all the types that are present in C and C++. For example, this int called int number is uh, an automatic lifetime variable. The same applies to this string and to this vector. So basically at the end of the block, which in this case is the main function, this will be destroyed and deallocated, this will be destroyed and deallocated, and this will be destroyed and deallocated, in their opposite order. So we can think about automatic storage as if it was a stack, which is a data, a data structure uh, that uh, basically works in the LIFO order, last in, first out. So let's see what happens when the, these variables get allocated and constructed. We push int number at the top of the stack, then we push string at the top of the stack, then we push vec at the top of the stack. Now our stack has vec as the, as the top element, then string, and then int number. When the objects get deallocated and destroyed at the end of the function, which is uh, uh, basically when they go out of scope, the first one to be deallocated will be the top of the stack, which is vec. Then our stack will look like this, and the top object will be stir. And then our stack will look like this, and the last objects to be allocated will be int number, which was the first one that was allocated. So, uh, the simplicity of uh, automatic storage makes it incredibly fast, and the compilers have a really easy time optimizing uh, uh, this kind of uh, storage. So, you should always uh, try to use the stack and automatic lifetime when possible. Uh, as it is uh, easier to reason about, uh, and so it reduces code complexity, and also it is uh, basically the best way to improve performance if you're using uh, dynamic allocations in, in your code. Now let's move on uh, to the next code segment, and uh, I'll explain what pointers are and how to use them. Okay, now that you have knowledge of uh, automatic storage, before we deal with dynamic storage, we need to learn what pointers are. Basically, in C and C++11, and in many other programming languages, we can think of variables as entities that have a type, a name, a value, and an address. So, uh, I created a little table here that shows uh, those, uh, those fields for these variables. For example, the variable with name e, i, sorry, has type int, value 10, and the address is uh, obtainable with this operator, which is uh, uh, the ampersand, and uh, we read this uh, instruction as address of i. f is a float variable with value 5, and its address is address of f. k, k is a, an int variable with uh, an unknown value because it was not initialized, and uh, its address is address of k. So, what does it mean for variables to have an address? Basically, the address is the location in memory where the variable is allocated. We can get the, the address of a variable with the uh, ampersand unary operator that uh, I like to read out as uh, address of. And getting the address of a variable returns a pointer to the type of the variable. Sorry, a pointer of the type of the variable. So, basically, if we get uh, the address of i, we will get uh, uh, returned a pointer to int, which uh, uh, can be expressed as int star. So it's easy to read uh, this kind of declarations uh, from the right to the left. So basically, we see that the pointer to, to i is a pointer to int, and it is initialized with the address of i. Uh, likewise, pointer to f is a pointer to float, and it is initialized with address of f. And likewise, likewise again, pointer to k is a pointer to int, and it is initialized with the address of k. So basically, a pointer is a memory address. When we get the address of a variable with uh, the address of operator, in return we get a pointer. We can access the value contained in a pointer, so in a memory address, 
using the unary operator star, uh, which is an asterisk, and I like uh, to call it the, uh, the reference operator. So basically, when we dereference a pointer, we get access to the contents of the pointer, to the value the pointer is pointing to. It's, uh, it can be confusing at first, but uh, I hope these examples will clarify what's happening here. So we'll print the contents of pointer to i, and we'll print the, con the contents of pointer to f. Since pointer to i is the address of i, the contents of pointers to i will be the value of i. So basically printing star pointer to i, which means printing the contents of pointer to i will print 10 because our i variable is 10. Printing the contents of pointer to f, and that is the same as saying printing the pointer to f dereferenced, prints 5 because the, uh, our f variable is 5.f. So basically, we can access variables through pointers by using the star operator, and uh, this kind of access is called dereferencing the pointer, and it allows us to get uh, the value the pointer is pointing to. We can also uh, set the value the pointer is pointing to by using the same operator, on the left side of an operation. For example, if we say uh, star pointer to k equals 15, we are assigning 15 to the value uh, pointer to k points to. So k, our variable k that we declared here, will become 15. And we can check if this is true by printing k, and it will now print 15, or by printing uh, again uh, star pointer to k, which will print 15, because uh, it is pointing to the k variable. So let's run the code and let's see what's up, what happens. Uh, again, I will put a return here so that uh, we won't get the uh, other uh, output and it will be easier to understand. In fact, this is our output and we can see that uh, printing the contents of pointer to e printed a 10, the contents of pointer to f printed a 5, k is 15, and so the contents of pointer to k printed 15. Let's move on to the rest of the code. So, uh, basically the opposite also applies. If we, we modify the, origin, the original variable, uh, the modification will be also be reflected uh, when accessing the pointer's contents. So basically, if we modify k, we will uh, uh, see that uh, that change uh, even when accessing the pointer to k. Because uh, uh, since pointer to k is pointing to k, and that means that pointer to k is the memory address of k, by modifying k, we will see the change reflected even when printing out the contents of pointer to k. So let's test it out in our terminal. And as you can see, uh, 20 is printed two times. We print it 20 once by printing the original variable, which is k, and we print it twice by printing the contents of pointer to k, which points to k. So, using pointers does not alter in any way the object's lifetime. Here is an example. Basically, we declare a pointer to int called pointer to nested outside of a code block. And inside the code block, we define a new variable called nested number and initialize it with uh, 42. And we will set pointer to nested uh, to the address of a nested number. So basically, pointer to nested is now pointing to nested number. However, if you recall, when uh, a variable goes out of scope, it is deallocated and destroyed. So, uh, we go to scope here, nested number goes, gets deallocated and destroyed, and uh, we have now uh, a very, uh, very big security flow, as uh, pointer to nested is now pointing to a memory location that is not valid anymore, because uh, nested number got deallocated and destroyed. So, even if uh, uh, pointer to nested seems to point to nested number, 
the truth is that the nested number got deallocated and destroyed at the end of its block. And now pointed to nested points to an invalid memory location. Accessing the contents of pointers, of pointer to nested is undefined behavior. This means that basically anything can happen. You can get garbage values or what is left in memory. In this case, it is very probably that printing the contents of pointer to nested will still print 42 because that's the last value that, uh, that is basically in memory. But uh, you shouldn't rely on this kind of behavior because it is undefined and anything can happen. So it can uh, act in another way on a different architecture or with different optimization options in your compiler. So uh, basically this, uh, this line causes undefined behavior because we're accessing a memory location which got freed and uh, destroyed. We, you should never do anything like this. So let's see another example of undefined behavior. Basically we can define a pointer to a vector of int here and we call it pointer to back. And inside a code block we'll uh, define a vector called back which contains four int elements and we'll assign a pointer to back to the address of the vector. So uh, now we will print out uh, the sides of back and the sides of pointer of the contents of pointer to back. You will see a new uh, operator here, which is the arrow operator, which is basically syntactic sugar uh, for uh, the referencing a pointer and accessing one of its members. So saying pointer to back arrow sides is exactly the same as saying star pointer to back dot size. Basically, we are accessing the, con the contents of the pointer and then we'll we're using the dot operator on the contents of the pointer when we're using the arrow operator. So obviously, these two lines will print uh, the same thing, which is four, that is the size of the vector. And then if we uh, access the vector either via the original variable or by the pointer, and basically we do something with the vector, in this case, we push back uh, the value 1, the size will change and the change will be reflected both on the back variable and the pointer to back uh, uh, contents. At the end of the block, back will uh, get out of scope and it will be destroyed and deallocated. So doing uh, operations uh, like we did inside of the block will cause undefined behavior. If we access uh, pointer to back here and call a method or check its sides, all of this is undefined behavior because back, the original vari variable, died at the end of the block. So running this code may do anything. It may print the right values so it may seem to work or it may print garbage or it may crash. We don't know, it's undefined behavior. So uh, even if it seems to work, do not be fooled because uh, it's, uh, the code working is uh, only one possible outcome on, of undefined behavior. And as I said earlier, relying on undefined behavior is the worst thing that you could ever do because your code will become not portable, optimizations may break it, and it may simply fail to work uh, and cause security issues. So now that we have a basic knowledge about pointers, so let's move on to the next segment where we deal with uh, dynamic object lifetime. We will also create a run version of std vector t of, um, with classes and the dynamic memory allocation to give you an idea of how vector is implemented in the standard library. Okay, welcome to the last code segment. This will be probably the hardest one. So uh, we are going to talk about dynamic storage, which is uh, basically dynamic allocation, the allocation of, ob of objects on the free store. Uh, to allocate and deallocate objects dynamically in C++, we use the new and delete keywords. And uh, allocating an object dynamically practically means uh, uh, grabbing and using an available piece of memory from the free store, which is basically a collection of available memory at runtime, not at compile time. So we can uh, uh, grab and use uh, uh, any dimension of memory that we need directly uh, during the execution of a program. So to allocate an object dynamically, we use the new keyword, which returns the address in which the object was allocated. So basically, when we say new int one, 
we are calling uh, the new operator on the int class and this is returning uh, an address in memory on the free store where this instance of int with value 1 was allocated and we store this address in a pointer and we'll call this pointer dynamic number which is a pointer to int so basically this line did a lot of things uh, it uh, basically found uh, suitable mo memory for the int on the free store and it allocated and constructed an instance of int in that uh, piece of memory and returned uh, its address to us and we also stored that address into a pointer called dynamic number. So it may seem complex at first, but uh, uh, it's not really difficult to, to understand once you get the hang of it. So uh, dynamic deallocation is not automatic. If uh, dynamic number uh, arrives at the end of the block, its contents will not be destroyed and deallocated. And that means that uh, the instance of int that uh, we allocated on the free store won't be destroyed and its uh, memory won't be freed. So basically forgetting to manually deallocating a dynamically allocated object uh, is the cause of uh, memory leaks, which is uh, an ST bug that uh, basically uh, prevents memory from being freed and uh, in the over the course of time it can make your program use much more memory than uh, than it needs to deallocate uh, an object that we allocated with a new keyword we must use the delete keyword so as we said new int here here we must say delete dynamic number so we use delete on the pointer that points to our uh, dynamically allocated object and this basically calls the destructor of int and also freeze the memory on the free store and make it and makes it available for further uses. So after calling delete, uh, as I just said, the destructor of the dynamically allocated objects will be called, and its memory will be freed. Now the dynamic number pointer will become invalid as it now points to a memory location which is uh, now free and uh, doesn't store anything. So it is good practice to set the pointer called dynamic number to null pointer, which is a new C++11 keyword that symbolizes a pointer to null, so an, an invalid pointer. And uh, this is very useful because later we can check if dynamic number is a valid pointer by simply comparing it to null pointer. So it is a, a very good practice uh, to set invalid pointers or empty pointers to null pointer, as uh, you can see here. Obviously, when uh, you free the, the contents of dynamic number using delete, you could also really uh, reuse the dynamic number pointer to allocate a new int on the free store, or maybe point to an existing int instance. So, let's see a more complex example. Uh, we'll use the class that we used in the previous code segment, which is the example class, that uh, does, does the exact same thing as before, which is printing CTOR on construction and DTOR on destruction. We'll open a new code block here and we'll dynamically allocate an instance of example with ID1 and store the address of, is, of this instance into the pointer ex1. We'll also declare a new pointer ex2 to example, this is a pointer to example, and we'll, in, we'll initialize it with a null pointer uh, to basically symbolize that to it isn't pointing to anything valid yet, but uh, it's here and uh, it may be used, uh, used later in the code. We'll also open uh, a nested block here and uh, basically we will uh, do the same thing as we did uh, in the other block. We'll allocate a dynamic instance of example with ID3 and store its address in the pointer ex3. We'll also assign ex2 uh, with uh, ex3 and this means uh, uh, that uh, the address uh, ex3 uh, will uh, be copied into ex2 so we are not dealing with the values the uh, ex2 and ex3 point to we are just assigning the addresses here so basically after this assignment ex2 and the ex3 point to this to the same address they both point to the same instance of example that has id3 
So let's begin uh, to analyze what happens. When we uh, allocate uh, an instance of example on the free store, Citor1 will be printed because uh, the new keyword automatically calls the constructor of example. And this happens uh, uh, here and here. So we will see Citor1 printed and Citor3 printed. Then we assign our addresses so that uh, ex2 and ex3 both point to this instance of example with id3. And uh, now, basically, uh, at the end of the inner block, ex3 will, give, will go out of scope. And uh, uh, it may look counterintuitive, but as we said here, earlier, uh, dynamically allocated objects are not destroyed automatically. So when we get out of scope, uh, this instance of example that uh, as id3 will not get destroyed. So dtor3 will not get printed, and uh, uh, this instance will still be alive on the free store. Uh, this is a clear demonstration that the dynamically allocated objects are not the allocated and destroyed automatically at the end of the block, like uh, automatic storage variables. Fortunately, we also have a pointer called ex2 that now points to the same dynamic example instance that uh, ex3 pointed, pointed to in the nested block. So we can avoid the memory leak by calling delete on x2 and that will basically free the memory location that ex3 was pointing to before it went out of scope. We will also delete the other dynamically allocated uh, object uh, which was uh, the contents of, of ex1. So basically uh, since uh, ex2 now refers to this instance of example we call delete on ex2 and we will free and destroy this instance. And then we'll also call delete ex1 and we'll free and destroy this instance. So basically, by saying delete ex1, we are printing dtor1 because we are destroying the first example instance with the id1. And by calling delete ex2, we, are, we will be printing dtor3 because we are destroying and deallocating the uh, instance of example with id3. Uh, take note that the destructors uh, are called in the order we specify, they aren't following the LIFO principle anymore. So, why is uh, dynamic memory useful? Basically, dynamic memory, uh, instead of automatic memory, allows us to uh, specify during the program's ex execution how much memory we want to allocate from the free store. Uh, it can be easier to explain and to show the usefulness of uh, dynamic allocation by using arrays. Uh, we haven't used arrays before, but uh, basically what you need to know is that uh, an array is a, contigu uh, sorry, a contiguous block of memory that contains a specific number of objects of the same type. So basically, if you create an array of int with sides 10, this is the syntax to define an array, we basically allocated the memory for 10 int objects. And then we can access uh, the objects by using the square brackets operator like this. This accesses the first objects, so the first object in the array. This accesses the second one, the third one, and so on. So, uh, to define an array uh, on the automatic storage, we need uh, to specify a site that is valid at compile time. So we can use a constant, uh, for example, an int literal, or a construct uh, variable, which is a new C++ keyword that I talked about in the earlier videos. And uh, these two declarations are perfectly fine because the compiler knows the size of the of array at compile time. But uh, if we, for example, get the sides from uh, uh, CN, so basically from user input, we will not be able to declare an array on the automatic storage because uh, uh, the compiler will not be able to know uh, what value runtime size will be at compile time. This will only be known at uh, runtime. So this uh, line of code is invalid. So, uh, as you can see, uh, dynamic allocation allows us to uh, allocate a contiguous block of memories that store uh, the same type of object, of object with a size that uh, it's known during the program's execution. 
So we can get uh, an int va value from uh, sin, basically from user input, and then by creating a pointer to an array and allocating a new array with uh, this syntax on uh, the free store, we can use here um, a variable that is not uh, a compile time constant. So basically we can allocate an array with uh, any size uh, thanks to dynamic allocation. Uh, another thing to take notice of is that uh, to deallocate a dynamically allocated array, uh, the delete keyword will not be uh, valid because uh, basically it will only delete part of the allocated memory. We, we must use instead the delete square brackets keyword, which is a completely different keyword, and uh, that will guarantee us that uh, the whole uh, memory that the array is occupying will be freed. So this line of code is invalid, while this one is correct. You must use delete square brackets when dealing with dynamically allocated arrays. So let's see an implementation, a very naive implementation of std vector. Basically, std vector is implemented internally with a dynamically allocated array. And what happens is that the, array, the vector has a capacity and the sides and when uh, you add a new element, basically the size of the vector increases and if it goes beyond the capacity, uh, basically inside of the vector the, the dynamically allocated array is reallocated with a bigger size so that uh, uh, it can contain more objects. So this is a very simple implementation that I created just to show you uh, how useful dynamic allocation can be. Basically, we are creating our own version of Vector, which is uh, an, an horrible implementation as it, as it only takes int values and probably has uh, bugs and uh, unsafe code. But uh, it's uh, good enough to show you how, how probably uh, and very roughly uh, the Vector in the standard library is implemented. Basically, inside of uh, our naive vector class, we store the capacity that uh, we initialize with two. We also store a pointer to the internal dynamically allocated array, and uh, we initialize it to a new uh, int of capacity capacity, with, uh, which is a two at the beginning. And we also uh, store the size of the vector, which is basically how many objects it is currently storing. And we initialize that to zero. So our pushback method will basically take an int value and it will set the last element of the array to the new value. The last element will be at the index size. Then we'll increase the size because the vector is now storing an additional object. And if the current capacity is not enough for the new size, we need to reallocate the dynamic array with a bigger capacity. So uh, our solution in this case is doubling the, the capacity and reallocating the array with a new one. So basically we check if the capacity is less than the size and if it is, we print this message for debugging purposes and we double the capacity and allocate a new array on the free store with the new capacity. Then we copy the current values from the old array into the new array with this simple for loop and then we delay, we, sorry, we delete the old array and we set the pointer that was uh, once pointed to the old array to the new array. Simple, right? Then we'll also have a print values method that prints information about the size and the capacity of the vector and uh, the element it contains. So to test our uh, horrible implementation, the, I've created a little test here. And basic, basically, it will start with size 0 and capacity 2. And uh, by pushing back more values and more values, the capacity will double and the size will uh, continually increase. So let's run uh, the code on the terminal and let's see what happens. Okay, I'll compile and run the code. Hello. So, as you can see, uh, the first value is pushed back here. This is the list of values, and the size will become 1 and capacity 2. Then, when we push the other values, sorry, when we push the other values, we must reallocate the internal array, and the capacity will double and become 4. And the size will also become 4 because now we have 4 values. 
Then, by pushing back uh, the other numbers, we must reallocate the internal array twice because we need at least uh, uh, 13, uh, an array big uh, 13 uh, spaces. And so the capacity will become 16 and the size will become 13. So as you can see, this is a very simple and uh, probably flawed implementation of vector, but I've created it just to show you uh, how memory of dynamic memory allocation can be useful and flexible. And in this case, uh, it allows us to store an indefinite amount of objects, which is uh, very useful in my opinion. So uh, dynamic memory management, as you just saw, is very tedious, error prone, you must remember to delete uh, the objects you allocated, you must remember to call the, the correct version of delete uh, on arrays, and uh, there are many other quirks that can make it uh, troublesome and bug prone. Thankfully, C++11 offers some new features, which are smart pointers that make it much easier and safer, and we'll take a look at those features in the next tutorial, along with uh, references and the differences that between preferences and pointers. So, thank you very much for watching. I hope you found the tutorial interesting. You can fork and take a look at the source code on my GitHub page, and uh, you can visit my website to learn more about my projects and my tutorials, and to get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. Uh, goodbye, and see you the next time.